welcome everyone to work 2.0 podcast today we have with us uh, a very interesting guest so very few times in our journey we got to talk to some impeccable transformational leader who who is not really just talking a talk who has walked the walks and and today we have such leader so robert greifeld uh, he's a chairman of virtue financials inc he previously served as chairman of the board of directors of the nasdaq stock market llc until may 10 uh, 2017 and as the chief executive officer of nasdaq from 2003 to 2016 during his te- tenure mr greifel led nasdaq through a series of complex innov- innovative acquisitions that extended the company's footprint from a single us equity exchange to a global exchange and technology solution provider nearly quadrupling revenue growing um, annual operating profits by more than 24 times and achieving a market value of over 11 billion dollars uh, mr greifel is a member of economic club of new york and nyu stern board of overseers he is a founder and chairman of the usa track and field um, foundation which supports emerging athletes and inner city youth athletics mr greifel holds a masters of business from nyu stern and ba in english from iona college with that um robert welcome to the podcast it is my pleasure to be here and please call me bob yes bob so firstly um to our friends and listeners and viewers this is the book and bob before i get into this thank you so much like i very few times um we uh, at least our entrepreneur side of our brain always crave for some experience from someone who has going through a transformation of a large corporation and going in at a personal level talking about what goes in their mind and around them and walking us through that so uh thank you so much for 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 this journey i i do appreciate that well i thank you for the kind words so before before we jump in love to um hear about your journey like what brought you to nasdaq like what's what's the fabric of a leader that that was able to pull nasdaq up, up out of this mess Well I would say this uh my journey to Nasdaq was not the standard journey that existed back in 2003 typically the head in exchange was a sinecure appointment as you got to the end of your career and it came from somebody who came from an investment banking background I had none of those backgrounds to me and I certainly didn't have the age at at that point in time I had been a software entrepreneur for 10 years and the product we built was a trading system for Nasdaq market makers so i had the in-depth knowledge of what the Nasdaq market was about and i had the entrepreneurial chops having built a company and then sold it in 1999 to Sungard Data Systems and i was fortunate with all that background to have on the board of directors of Nasdaq uh private equity firms from Silicon Valley who recognized when you stripped away the license of Nasdaq it really was a technology transaction processing company that needed somebody like myself to lead it interesting and and um, i think one thing i was wondering about when uh, when i was reading this book is how has your childhood has helped you shape to become the person and take the, those risks and bold moves walk us through some of your your childhood journey if you can that's Uh, that has really helped you become what you are. <laughs> well, that's going back a long, long way. But I would say fundamental to my success is I was raised in a low, lower middle class environment. My dad worked for the post office. We had five children. He always had to have two jobs. So we understand. We understood cleanly, uh, cleanly the value of work and the value of really using your resources, your money in in a wise way. and i always remember back to my mom in particular saying you know you can do everything you want in life which seemed uh kind of uh you know nonsensical at the time but i realize now that that guided me through uh different phases of my professional development interesting and so um let's let's talk about sort of the nasdaq days right so when right. you are uh, when you are given this baton to sort of run um such a uh, ginormous uh, us equity company and and you are as you said you are a industry outsider in in some perspective you ha- you have a soft software background now coming to um, to this um, 
uh, hardcore uh, financial services company how do you grapple with that fact like what are some of the things that you you end up doing um, to s- prepare yourself to steer the ship so it's interesting so i would say this i came in there having been an outsider and knowing exactly what the challenges were with respect to the technology and the transa- transaction processing uh, uh, business. So as I cover in the book, I came in there day one and before eight o'clock in the morning, asked two of the se- senior managers who worked directly for the CEO that they, you know, it was time for them to move on. And I wanted to make sure that I communicated directly to the all employees that there was a new sheriff in town. We're going to do things in a new and different way. I knew before I started that everybody was prepared to get involved with discussions of how they did it currently and why that was the right way to do it. I did not believe we had the time for those kind of internal monologues, internal dialogues. And so I wanted to change the culture then and there. It was not a piece of uh, things that I wanted to negotiate. And so I think that's not the right management style over a long period of time, but when you're in a crisis situation, you have to operate in that mode. Uh, so I, I did that. So I had a very clear view of what I wanted to do on the technology side, on the transaction side, having lived that. But what was interesting is when I came to NASDAQ, I realized I knew nothing with respect to the publicity aspect of being a CEO of NASDAQ. I knew nothing about the government relations aspect of being the CEO of NASDAQ, nor did I understand the necessity of having personal relationships with the various CEOs listed with your company, and your brand was tied to that. So while I was confident in terms of what I had to do, I also then, you know, really uh, learned a lot in those first, you know, six months. Interesting. And um, I think one thing that, that was pretty stuck to me when I was reading the book was, so so you had this two ideologies. So one is, um, so one sort of, uh, you, you were talking about that direction is important and, and pace may not be that relevant. You know, that if you're doing the right direction, you will eventually get there. Things take their own time. And the other aspect is, say, NAS, something like, say, if NASDAQ is not, is sinking or it's not going in the direction it's going, how do you grapple these two facts together? So it's 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 a big enough company that it will take things are really really slow uh, when when you when it comes to transforming an organization, and and on on the other side you know things takes time. How do you as a as as a um, uh, captain of the ship sort of bring these two thoughts together that I need to act um, quickly and I know whatever I act it will take probably some time and so how do you grapple the fact between these two? these two sort of uh, divulging thoughts? Well, uh, a good and complicated question. So let me uh, start by saying why you're essentially uh, scared to death as you're going through this radical transformation. Uh, Because I live with the fundamental thought that success is not preordained, nor is failure. And the difference between success and failure are two sides of a very thin dime. Uh, so you have to then execute, work hard every day to be on the right side of that thin dime, right? So when I'm there in the first year, I'm not going to work in the morning or going home at night saying, okay, this thing is guaranteed, right? I always said, I don't have a magic wand. I know what we have to do. We're going to do it. We're going to execute as quickly as we can. And we're still not sure what's going to come out the uh, other end. And so this was not like the imperial CEO confident in everything. You might project more that image, but you still know that nothing is assured in life. So with respect to directly answer your question, the timing, obviously things take time. Your job is to compress that t- cycle of uh, time frame and innovation. So I came to NASDAQ, you know, you only had one way of communicating to the market and then the rest of the world want to communicate in a different world way. And, you know, it took us six months to get there. And that six months, it was painful uh, because I know I needed it yesterday, but you had to be patient because all you could do is do what you can do and, and do it well. But it also ties back to what I have said all along. And I learned this through the years at NASDAQ. I met so many CEOs. Right, more than anybody, uh, really, in a, in a way. And when you meet and talk to these CEOs, they're very smart and they're very hardworking. But yet I see many of them fail. 
And I said, well, why are they failing? And it's very apparent. They fail because they don't choose the right things to work on, right? You always have to choose the things that have the biggest lever, the biggest lever in terms of leveraging your time to be uh, effective. So when you're there and your things, you know, the smoke the fog of war is up, you got to make sure you're choosing the right things. And also what's very difficult is you have to choose the things you're not going to do well, right? That is very hard, right? Because these CEOs, they're, you know, success driven type A, they want to do everything well. They want to be the best at everything. You don't have enough time in the day to be the best at everything. You have to choose to be the best in the things that are fundamentally important or uh you know really just fundamental to you know to your business where you fail if you don't do these things well so that's that's what i thought all right what do i have to do well right what is absolutely imperative that you well that's on that critical success path we'll resume after a short break this part of the podcast is brought to you by first friday fair fastest ai powered way to find your next opportunity check out the website first friday fair dot tao dot ai and find your next dream job let's get back to the podcast interesting and um like looking inside like when you are going say in nasdaq and looking outside in in something like this or this organization with which uh the market is shifting and you know that it needs something needs to be done to sort of help uh, these companies steer out if you look at um say other ceos um as you as you were saying uh who are just about to take control of um, a company that is seeking desperate transformation right so what would be what would be your suggestions and thoughts um, to those leaders who are going like looking outside in, in these challenges of transforming their own organization through sort of cultural change and this market condition change yeah so i i i would kind of you know summarize what we just spoke at in a way right so one is you have to be are short of the path, right? So you're put there and it's certainly better if you have the path in your mind. If you have to go on a listening tour and learn, uh, you know, when you're in crisis, you don't typically have that period of time. So the board really should hire somebody who can then hit the ground running. And when I interviewed for the job at NASDAQ in the last interview, which I think got me you know, over the line with respect to the offer was I said, this is what I am going to do in the next hundred days, you know, bullet point by bullet point. I'm coming here day one. I know what the plan is. So uh, if you're coming, if you're a company in crisis and the incoming CEO doesn't have a plan and needs to go on a listening tour, I think that's a bad hire, you know, from uh, my perspective. So you've got to one, have the plan, you obviously will have to modify the plan. And one of the things we talk about in the book is tied to what Jim Collins had in Good to Great. You have to get the right people on the bus, right? You cannot overemphasize that. And certainly when I believe in the plan, the 100-day plan, the one-year strategic plan, the three- to five-year strategic plan, uh, you've got to believe in that. But you have to understand that by definition, those plans will be wrong. And you will mm-hmm. have to modify those plans and you have to have the people on the bus have the ability to recognize that we have to evolve, we have to change the reality we thought we uh, were talking about six months, a year, two years ago is different than the current reality and we have to respond uh, to that. So you have to be clear of purpose, recognize that you'll be wrong, you're going to have to modify that, you have to have the right people and certainly you know, when you have the right people, life gets you know, fundamentally easier. Interesting. And let's talk about, uh, spend a few minutes on the right people, right? So what is your um, secret recipe to find the right people uh, to engage when, when you're sort of taking, uh, taking a challenge? So I, I would say this, you know, I had a yardstick in my mind that 80% of the promotion should come from in-house, 20% outside. The 80% inside is because those people won your success rate will be a lot higher in that you basically have years to interview them you get to see how they perform in different situations over time they are part of the culture they know how the culture works no matter how good your interview process is 
it's never as good as having somebody there that you go no so important to recognize and i take great pride you know adina was uh who's my successor was there you know you uncover the hit hidden gems now i say 80 percent, not 100 percent, because clearly you need to get fresh blood coming in also mm -hmm. right you need to extend uh the culture the culture like anything else has to evolve over time and if you go 100 percent, then it'll become too inbred you'll have a lack of new concepts coming in you'll lack some you know, what I call positive discordance in the organization. But 80% is an overwhelming number of people. You do that, your success rate is very high with the 80%. And then, you know, that ensures that you're having the right people on the bus. Interesting. Now, and but I should say then when you want to do 80%, then you have to be able to train them, which we can talk about separately, right? Because they're not ready to be in a position just automatically. Interesting. And um, so, the time that when you join NASDAQ, it's a very interesting time uh, for at least the financial services company. Uh, almost every, in a way, every company in the industry, they're going through this digital transformation keyword and it was just emerging and getting into the live stream of these companies where they're trying to find digitization uh, into the mainstream of businesses. And it must have been challenging for um, a company like NASDAQ because it culturally it requires sort of a redefining um, how to do business and how to perceive market and how to sort of appreciate market. So how do you like, ensure that um, the company is transforming with the pace that's required for it to grow? So, you know, one is I talk about you can ensure it by mandating it as the autocratic CEO. Mm -hmm. And at times that is the right answer. Most of the times it not, it's not, but at times it's the right answer. Uh, the second is you can ensure it by making sure that you have the people who know that they have to steer the bus and the bus will have to go in different uh, directions there. And that is the culture. What, what is right today will not be right tomorrow. I remember mm -hmm. saying that uh, you know, many, many times. So you have to have that attitude, right? Because we were successful doing this yesterday in certain ways, guarantees us we won't be successful doing it tomorrow. And the other thing I say, which I do mention in the book, is once you achieve competency, you have to battle complacency, right? Mm -hmm. So we had to have that in the organization, right? You have to battle complacency. And this is not extreme where you have this high performer who then one day comes in and just kind of mails in results and operating at 50% uh, of his capacity, his or her capacity. It's a lot more subtle than that. You go from somebody who's, you know, really hard charging, 100% producer, now they're at 92%, right? Mm. So 92% sounds not bad or 94%, but as I said, the difference between success and failure are two sides of a thin dime, right? And the 100% person could be the su uh, succeed, the 92% person could be the person who fails. So you have to have that culture recognizing that that's there and uh i remember one time somebody said to me you know list your you know top accomplishments at nasdaq you've been there eight ten years and i said if i start sitting around talking about that then i would hope the board would say let's get a new ceo in here so mm -hmm. in a way when i talk about complacency it gets easier not just with competency but when you have something to talk about about what you achieved there and as it went on in my career I would always say, okay, I have to make sure, you know, I'm keeping these words true to myself and would Bob, the shareholder, you know, be happy with the mental state of Bob, uh, the CEO. And as you make a decision mm -hmm. that's time to move on, that is something that factors in uh, to your decision. You know, I'm a shareholder here and, you know, I've got this CEO here who's been doing a great job for the last 10 or 12 years, but, you know, that doesn't matter. When he comes to work in January the 1st, you know, is that person as hungry as they were a decade ago? Or are they really just having a creeping complex, uh, complacency coming into their day-to-day uh, -day life? Interesting. So um, I think uh, last last month I was talking to one of the CEO of Fortune 100 company and, and he was telling me how um, uh, being a CEO is... So CEO is an ecosystem. It's not a person, right? So you you bring in sort of that that uh, that infrastructure, 
that enable the company to think the way you're thinking. So from your perspective, like what are what are sort of your um, um, recipe of success? Like what 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 is your ecosystem that really helped you um, like transform company like Nasdaq? Like how do you who are your key people uh, or, or the ingredients of key people that helps and, and empower you to make makes right decision as, as you rightly said that and, and sort of in the right direction? Right. So what, what you're getting at is, uh, you know, a couple ways to think about it. Uh, you have people who have great content knowledge, great IP about their chosen uh, responsibility, right? Uh, and that's certainly a, a necessary ingredient, but by itself is not sufficient. Or then you have hyper bright, hyper motivated people who don't know the particular space, but will dive in and learn it. Uh, you know, quite in, intensely. So somewhere in a witch's brew mix of those two skill sets. So point, you have great athletes given a position that mm -hmm. they will then grow into with respect to the particular domain expertise, IP related to that uh, position. And other times you just say, okay, I have this content expert. They might not be a great manager. They might not be the person who's going to run through every wall but their insight and wisdom in these topics, you know, really uh, are, you know, what predominates. So I, I would say that, you know, the former is something I would value slightly higher than, than the latter. And certainly over time, maybe not in a given moment for time. So what answering your question, you know, you have to then, and we keep going to come back to the right people mm -hmm. that to be the culture carriers and they have to be, you know, uh, persistent. You know, I remember back in the time when I used to read a lot of business books, uh, and there was one of the early books on on Bill Gates. And I was reading that as a relatively young man. And in the book, he said he never succeeded at what he attempted the first mm -hmm. time he attempted it. And it was always the persistence. And I said, well, Bill Gates doesn't succeed the first time. Then what chances mm -hmm. do I have? And what's the lesson here? So that stayed with me. So when you look at the character of the people you want on the team, it has to be that character of persistence that the first defeat is only the first de defeat and you're going to carry on from there. Interesting. And um, let's let's talk about um, some of the learning. So when Wall Street is going through its digital dis <clears throat> disruption, what were some of the learning that you uh, that you observed as you were grooming Nasdaq through this digital disruption? So one of the things we learned, which I think the rest of the industries will learn, is that we took what was uh, job functions of people on the floor, which would be fairly sophisticated. And since it was entirely in the digital age and didn't have what I call today, you know, manual dexterity requirements, we were able to put fairly complicated logic, right, mm -hmm. with a lot of condition, a lot of if and conditions into code right where people had done this before so when we look you know nothing to do with my book and my experience but when you certainly look at how industries will be transformed in the years and decades to come we can look at what we accomplished on wall street and recognize that some relatively high iq functions can in fact put into a ai or machine learning uh context and you know the advantage we have is since we're dealing with pure digitals, we didn't need the manual dexterity that a lot of human jobs have. And so when you look at the intelligence required in the AI systems, you know, their biggest challenge is not that, but more about the manual dexterity living in the, in the physical world. So we're able to reduce it to bits and bytes. And, you know, there was some very sophisticated code that uh, we had to write to make this happen, you know, which is, you know, quite fun, actually. Interesting. And um... we'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI-powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. I, I want your perspective on very sort of very interesting um, differences that we are seeing in, in in the market right now. So there are two companies. So one say company like GE, or if you say a company like say um, Netflix. So if GE miss out on a quarter, the market hammers the hell out of those, right? And if uh, Netflix um, misses, so it's it's perceived in a different lens. 
So when you are, say, company like Nasdaq, like how would it perceive sort of these two different uh, scenarios on a single uh, index? Like how do you how do you sort of bring the differences together and, and sort of create a single index out of this? So what you would hear is people would say the public markets are short-term oriented, right? So I had to live mm -hmm. through that through my whole career. And I would push back on them. And I would say, here, the facts are, that if you present to your investors a certain thesis, right, and you stick to that thesis, the markets can have an incredibly long period of patience. Mm -hmm. And in our industry, at NASDAQ, we won like 95% of the biotech companies that came to market. And their average time frame to get an approval for a new drug mm -hmm. uh, was about a decade, right? And really, it was a little bit more than that. So in that decade, investors had to believe. And investors obviously bought a tremendous amount of biotech stock in the time I was there. And they didn't pay attention to the quarter because they didn't come there saying, I'm going to make these quarterly numbers. Now, if they missed a approval from the FDA, then clearly the stock had a problem. So if you are coming public saying, this is our plan, right? And then investors self-select to buy into your plan by buying shares, then you do what you need to do. If investors buy into your plan because you're going to make quarterly numbers or have a certain revenue amount, you don't do it, you'll be penalized. So it's a matter of transparency and effectiveness of communications. The public investors, not just in biotech, but at Amazon, have shown a tremendous tolerance for businesses to grow over a period of time. And you mentioned Netflix, right? So today, uh, you know, Netflix, I think, if uh, they didn't get the subscriber growth that investors thought, maybe not the profitability, mm -hmm. then their stock will suffer, right? So they're going, you know, they, they went from just a broad plan to really now it's about subscriber growth, growth and clearly it'll be about profitability in, in the not too distant future. Interesting. And um, I think a um, couple of months back, I was talking to Tim O'Reilly about um, sort of this idea of that, uh, the fiduciary responsibility of a CEO uh, towards the state shareholder versus now going to sort of um, uh, it's it's no longer to at least getting the profitability, but at least as you rightly saying uh, uh, subscriber base and and some some other uh, other dynamics. So from from your vantage point, uh, uh, you uh, having observed this industry for quite um, many years, how are you seeing the the role of a shareholder changing when it comes to the impact of a, any company has uh, when when it's it's in a stock market like is it um, so are the companies now sort of focusing more on the on 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 the employees or they are still sort of uh, fiduciary responsible to give out churn out profits and profits every time uh, to the to the shareholders like what what's your perception well it depends right so clearly i i think in the end state of valuation is going to be about your discounted cash flow, right? Mm -hmm. So if you get even your accounting earnings, mm -hmm. right, you're going to value this enterprise over the long term on what kind of cash uh, it's generating. So that is the black hole that everybody gets sucked into and investors have to believe in. So investors, when they want to uh, invest in an early stage company, it's not profitable. They're mm -hmm. doing that because they have models and belief that in time, this business will be very profitable. And when you're a pure technology company where marginal cost uh, against the marginal dollar revenue can be quite low, then mm -hmm. people will be willing to take that bet for a period of, of time. So I think, you know, that's just a fact of life that mm -hmm. nothing will change. We'll have certain, you know, standard deviations away from that different during different times in the market uh, and the market cycle. But you're going to land up back in, in that situation. So what you're bringing up, though, in addition to driving towards those financial goals, do the CEOs have responsibilities beyond the shareholders to stakeholders, right? So uh, my feeling on this, and I, I've written on this, uh, is that if you uh, are concerned about the delivering results to the shareholders, you will always act in your enlightened self-image. 
uh, self-interest, right? Mm -hmm. And that means that you will have to pay attention to uh, stakeholders, right? Because you operate in the environment you operate in. And uh, I think that's fundamental. So the fact is CEOs, you know, would be stupid to just try to worry about the given quarter and not worry about anything else. So I think, you know, it's more really more wordsmithing rather than anything else in terms of what CEOs are doing. Interesting. And and, and another perspective I want your, uh, I want your perspective on is um, the future of work, right? So right now, because of automation, we are seeing I, like almost every business right now, or at least many, like we are in talks with many governments on their their sort of anxiety they're of losing out on tax dollar because if their main source of revenue is people employed and paying taxes, right? So if automation is sort of not uh, displacing workforce and they're not trained in fast enough, then obviously they will lose out on 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 the tax um, collections. So how is uh, from your vantage point how are like, what's your take on that like what would you see what are you seeing the future companies or the companies uh, how would they resolve this like would would be living in a company that's completely automatable or like what's what's your take on that so i i would say this uh that right now i have a feeling that the pace of change with respect to uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, natural language uh, is going to accelerate quite dramatically in the next 10 years. And this will have a material impact on the nature of work and the opportunities for employment. Mm -hmm. I also am keenly aware that if I had said this for each of the last 50 years, right, these exact words, I would have been wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So the Luddites have been predicting the fact that technology change will eviscerate work as we know it for a long period of time. And we're sitting here with, you know, a 50 year low in unemployment. So mm -hmm. in fact, in spite of those facts, I still think that we certainly have a situation where the pace of technology change will be massive, right? And the, ro the robots are coming is another thing, you know, that I'm saying. In, in some form or fashion. So I think society will have to deal with that. And certainly uh, whether they're dealing with it is what I call taxing the robots in, in some way, you know, we'll have to deal with that. So I believe that, uh, but like I say, you know, caution my belief because I would have been wrong for the last 50 years, right? People for the last 50 years protect, you know, thinking that we're gonna have massive unemployment because of all the automation that's happened. But we've seen the nature of work change and most of the jobs that exist today did not exist 50 years ago. So you get those two thoughts, right? The world will change, but we'll adapt to it and there'll be a new nature of work. Or the other world is the world will change so quickly that we'll live in a period of time where the machines are doing everything and people are not left with a lot to do. Interesting. And and um, your take on sort of building the next leaders, right? So what is what is your secret recipe of building your successor? Like, how do you end up like what are how do you empower the new and emerging leaders and how do you prepare them? What's your if you can walk us through the process? Sure. Well, certainly when you're saying you want to hire 80 percent from within, mm -hmm. it's fundamental that you have the ability to train uh, the, these folks. So let's start before, you know, just the leaders, but when you think about yourself as a young person today is, I like to say, you need technical training. The world is not going to get less technical, right? 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, the world will not be less technical. It'll be more technical. So when I got my NBA, which I went at night for, you know, I uh, majored in computer applications and information systems, they called it that. And I did an English undergrad. So I had all the basic, you know, finance economics courses. But the fact that I spent most of my time in the computer age, you know, was fundamental uh, to me. And I think with all this, it's not saying you need to be a computer scientist, but you have enough, to have enough background knowledge to learn. And I think about my career, I think the MBA from NYU is fundamental. As an English undergrad, I learned a lot, but to have the basics of accounting, economics, finance, and more on the computer side, uh, that allowed me to learn, 
right? It's not like the learning ended. It allowed me to start the learning because once you get into the job environment, you have to make sure that you are definitely a beneficiary of continuing education and to seek it out. Interesting. So now, now let's spend a few minutes on the book. So right. um, why write this book? Like, What's the premise behind this book? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so one, obviously, I would not write a book like that until I was gone from NASDAQ because I said I don't want to be reflecting back. So it was a time to reflect back. When you think of the era that I served in, I started in 2003. The dot-com bubble had just burst. Right, we we're living in the aftermath of that. Uh, we had some difficult times. Then the world changed, and I think that Mark was, you know, during the Google IPO, we said we went to a tailwind environment. We went right to the credit crisis after that. We went to a deep freeze and the Great Recession there, and you had to then build from there and diversify your business model. So we saw a lot of interesting things, you know, overlaid by technology, regulatory changes. So I thought there was some interest uh for people right there's some good stories in the book i saw the uh the wall street journal said i was a wry storyteller whatever that means i'll take it as a compliment mm -hmm. so there's uh, there's good you know good historical backdrop there's good stories there's good management lessons that i thought would be interesting for people interesting we'll resume after a short break this part of the podcast is brought to you by first friday fair fastest AI powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. Uh, but, and by the way, I love sort of how you close every chapter with very concise management. I think this is beautiful. What, what's the leadership lesson learned and all. I think yeah. that's a nice way to uh, close out on our thoughts. Uh, thank you for that. So um, I think so when, when we talk to um, who is who is the prospective reader like when you who do you wrote this book for like what is your what is a, what's an ideal reader for this book ideal reader for the book well i i think you have i i don't really know but i would say this uh uh i mean anybody who has an interest in uh business right because mm. you know it's fundamentally a uh, a business book Anybody who wants to be titillated by stories of some of the big figures who have walked the planet here, whether it be Jeff Bezos or Steve Jobs, will be interested in the book. Anybody who wants to understand how a business can handle not just good times but bad times, because mm -hmm. that's you know we we have a pretty good handle of that in the book. We're very clear. And anybody who wants to talk about you know how do you take a company that's really a, a single product company, meaning a U.S. equity exchange, and turn that into a global multi-asset, multi-business kind of uh, corporation and the steps you take along that way, I think we'll find that pretty interesting. Interesting. So um, when we talk to the authors, some of them, they say that um, some, uh, some sort of some of the books that inspired their work. So do you have, say, sort of book that you took inspiration uh, from? while writing this book? Uh, I, I would say not, but I would say on the book, you know, as an English major, there are hidden uh, Bob Dylan, Jack Kerouac references in there. So I encourage uh, people to find them. And, you know, in the book, I do talk obviously about Jim Collins, Good to Great. We use that mm -hmm. as a semi guide post as we uh, built the organization. As you read, you know, I've, uh, obviously been a big consumer of the books of, you know, the leading figures in the NASDAQ marketplace, whether it be Steve, you know, Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or people uh, uh, like that. Uh, but, you know, what's interesting, and you're getting into a topic is how do you get to be a good leader and how do you get to make good decisions? And that doesn't mm -hmm. mean you have to be the CEO by any stretch of the imagination. It could be in your personal life. It could be uh, in your charitable giving. So, you know, to me, I, I think you've got to increase the denominator of your knowledge, right? So as mm -hmm. you, and this is where I think sitting in a seat is important because you increase your baseline knowledge. And I always do believe at the end of the day, you feel like your decisions are made at the gut level, but they're really not, right? Because you have that database in your head, right, of what you built up. You put your 
intelligence systems on top of it. I was going to say artificial intelligence, but mm -hmm. since it's in your brain, it's not artificial. So you put your natural learning systems, your intelligence systems on it, and it creates a witch's brew, and that gives you the answer uh, there. So when you talk about the denominator of knowledge, reading a book like mine helps with the denominator, uh, and you should always be trying to uh, you know, do that. And so you're in a position you know, to make the right decisions. Interesting. And um, let's spend a few minutes on, on, on your journey, right? So um, tell me, how do you spend your days today? Like, what do you do nowadays? Well, I, I would say this. So I'm 62, and I reference uh, in the book, you know, if I, uh, if I knew I was going to live to 110, I would have still wanted to be the CEO of NASDAQ because I love the, mm -hmm. uh, the job. But I recognize that, you know, life is finite. I don't know if you knew that, but I'm telling you that uh, for the first time. And the, <laughs> and the opportunity cost actually increases not on a linear basis, but an exponential basis as your number of days decrease on, on a linear basis. So, you know, I, I said, one, with NASDAQ, I realized that I was not as fundamental as I was in the beginning of the time there. The management team had matured. It was such a strong team led by Adina that I knew it could carry on. And I knew that my time at NASDAQ was becoming certainly not routine, but more routine. And I didn't feel like I was jumping off the cliff like I had been. So they, all these things came together. And the other thing you know is that when the kids are little, they're just mm -hmm. always there, right? They meet your schedule. Now my kids are grown and I have to start meeting their schedule and be available when they're available, which is a fair turnaround is, is is fair play you also know that uh your parents are old and you want to be there as you get uh get to end of life so all these things came in but in no situation did i say i wanted to start stop working right mm -hmm. i did want to give have more time to give back right uh because that you know takes mm -hmm. time to do that uh so where i do now is when i'm very comfortable i am spending more time effort and money giving back and giving back in ways that are important to me that I think can help others and, and society. And giving back is certainly to my kids and my parents, uh, which is a fun thing. And on the work side, I always thought of myself as an entrepreneur. A, it's called fintech now. It's a popular term. So I wanted to get back to my entrepreneurial roots. So I have a number of investments in fintech companies, of which I'm on the board of. And we're having a great time trying to conquer the world and be David again instead of Goliath. You know, so fundamentally, I want to be uh, uh, David. So, you know, we have a good time there. Interesting. And, and thank you for walking us through that. So if and we ask all of our guests to share, like what what are some, if, if we say what are some of the qualities that has helped you become what you are that really defines you? What what are those qualities like? What would you attribute your success to which qualities? All right. So the first thing I would say is, uh, you know, I was very successful and there's a price to pay and it's not for everybody. And I covered it in the book. Don't expect to have, if you want to be hyper successful, don't expect to have a balanced life, right? Mm. The best you can hope to achieve is an integrated life, mm. right? And where you integrate the family and business and it just mm. works. But the balance doesn't happen, right? Because mm. work, especially if you're the CEO, is a hard deal. And so this is not for everybody. And because somebody says, I don't want to be the CEO, there's a price to pay. I'd love to have mm -hmm. the money the CEO makes, but there's a price to be paid. And you can be in different rings of the organization, have a great life in certain ways, a better life than people are. So I, I never wanted to create the environment like it's this is what is the right answer for mm -hmm. uh, everybody uh, there. Uh, and I also said to people who have said, you know, how do I get to where you are? I would say, well, one is find a job that you love, right? That you bring passion to uh, every day. Then you'll do that job well. You do that job well, you'll be recognized and other opportunities will present themselves. So I never had this career path in mind, but I do, did, thing, did things that I really had a great passion for. And then that creates its own false expectation. I said, well, it's important to recognize when you have a job you bring passion for, that doesn't mean when the alarm clock goes off on Monday morning, you're like, oh, great, finally, I, have to, I don't have to go on a weekend. I can get back to work, right? It's not that kind of a thing, but it's still 
So I don't quite agree with Warren Buffett. You skip to work every day. Uh, that seems a little extreme to me. Uh, but you have to have a similar type of passion for it. And I think, as you can sense, I have a clear feeling that life is finite. And for you to spend a year, two, or three years doing a job to check a box to get another uh, you know, point in the org chart, I think is just fundamentally wrong. I, I wouldn't do it. You know, my career would never mean that much to me. I would never take career over life. You got to do the jobs that you want to do. Interesting. So, uh, and and we did, we ask all of our guests to you know, like share some of their favorite reads, some of the books that has really helped. Um, that is that that has inspired that has that has inspired them. And um, like, would you have some books that you could share with our listeners and viewers? Yeah. Well, first off, uh, uh, I I want to tell my own book because it's pretty damn <laughs> not decent you there. But you know, one <laughs> well done, well done. Uh, but, you know, I, I would say this. I'd break it down, obviously, uh, in terms of books you read for reading pleasure, which also mm -hmm. will give you uh, uh, certain insights. But, you know, on the business book side, I've always uh, enjoyed the Jim Collins books. Mm -hmm. And I've enjoyed uh, the, I thought the biography of Steve Jobs uh, mm -hmm was you know uh, quite insightful in terms of what you could uh, you know learn uh, uh, from that so I, I think when I, I think about different books I tie back to my comment about you want to build that database of knowledge that you have right mm. so most of it is going to be what you experience in the real world but uh, you you have to then augment that by things you can read because when somebody writes a book if somebody's done this now I mean you have to distill a lot of information down right and so you're getting the essence of it so when I read a good book I recognize that uh, you know it's the essence of knowledge that somebody gained over a long period of time but it's never something you get like okay I learned so much from it but it is building the database you, you can grow from uh, but you know obviously when you read books for you know literature books for fun then there's a lot you can learn about human nature from them also. Interesting. And and thank you for sharing that. And we are um, at the last end of the conversation and, and it's the last right. question but not the least. So if you want um, something our listeners and viewers to take away from this conversation, like if you want um, something that people should get uh, that we have not covered in the conversation and what would that be? Like what would be a closing remark to our listeners and viewers? Well, you know, you know, when I when I started with Nasdaq, uh, you know, its market cap was you know under five hundred million dollars. I left; it was uh, over thirteen, and we uh, grew ourselves from a single asset to this global organization. Uh, and when you look from the beginning to the end, you say, "Wow, that's hard." Uh, how would you do that? And the same thing with your career. You look from the beginning, and I started as a sales rep for Burroughs Corporation in 1979 and where I ended up. But I, I would say this, that uh, in both situations, it was one logical step after the other, and the mm -hmm. next step built on the prior step, right? So you can do the 1,000-mile march a step at, at a time. There's no big leaps, right? It's one step, next step. So you want to be always building, you know, have passion for what you're doing, building upon it in terms of your career and in terms of what you're doing uh, in your day-to-day -day life. Uh, with that, um, thank you so much, Bob, for, for, for sharing your time with us. I wish you nothing but success on this book. And thank you so, so much for, for uh, doing your social work and, and, and dropping this thing in so we all could actually learn <laughs> what it takes to create a company and transform it. And, and thank you sort of for creating that movie and, and, and sort of helping us understand all the perspective of, of, of your journey. And, and thank you so much. Uh, you're always welcome back on the podcast. So if uh, there's a C so is there any plan for a sequel of this? I'm not sure of that yet. <laughs> Let me focus on the one book right now, but we'll see. It was my pleasure so, to be here. And I do look forward to coming back. Right? <laughs> awesome. Okay. I, I, I think thank you so much on that. And whenever you're in Boston, let me know. I'd love to meet at some point. I, um, and that'll I think, be a lot uh, of fun. Personally, thank you so much on, 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 on your journey and, and spending your time with us. I, I do appreciate that. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Have a great day. Awesome. You too. Yeah, yeah, I just, I just, uh. I just.
I thought I was sick of home, but actually I was homesick. Never really knew that I would have to grow up so quick. I'm so uncomfortable, don't know anybody here. Just a couple dudes that I met once, that's it. And I go into the booth feeling nervous. Got butterflies in my stomach like I'm so worthless. Is the mic on? I don't know how to work this. Inside I'm breaking down, I hope I'm not up on a